All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We are going to start today's uh, panel on the metaverse. So if you could please direct your attention to the front here. And Greg Bruner from Esri is going to give us a quick uh, introduction, a, a pre-show on detecting fires across Ukraine. And over to Greg. Uh, thank you. So my name is Greg Bruner and I work with Esri. I've, I've been a data scientist at Esri for about 12 years now. And today I'm gonna talk about how we can detect fires across Ukraine using Sentinel-2 imagery and some remote sensing and deep learning techniques. And so about eight months ago, I saw this tweet online that says, this is insane. The whole duration of U the Ukraine front line is just burning, pure living hell. And it made me think, you know, wow, how does this manifest itself? And how do I actually verify this? And so, um, you know, this was July 7th, 2022. And Esri has an app out there called the Sentinel-2 Explorer. And so I went into the Sentinel-2 Explorer and amazingly, uh, Sentinel-2 had been flying over uh, this part of Ukraine on July 7th, 2022, and it was cloud free. So you could get a really good picture of what those fires look like and see whether they're urban, whether they're rural, whether they're in farm fields or in forests. And uh, I was just fascinated by this. And so, you know, I, I passed this idea around to some, some friends and some colleagues and, uh, and, you know, we're just trying to kick ideas around about what we should do. Um, and so, you know, from these four scenes here too, uh, it might be hard to see, but it might not be actually. So if you look at Izium, you actually see through this uh, shortwave infrared view, you can see the smoke and the fires where that smoke originates. Um, and here, you know, you can see that these fires are, some of them are rural, right? Like in Izium, but then some of them are urban, like in Zaporozhye, where, um, you know, either there's some kind of industrial area or, or, or mining area or railway area um, where you can see the fires uh, in a more urban environment. And so I wanted to uh, not just detect these fires, but quantify, try to quantify their impact. And I haven't gotten to the point where I'm like quantifying you know, acreage of, of farm fields that have burned or forests that have burned, uh, or even necessarily summing up the total of the fires that I've detected. Um, but I've at least been putting in the framework to detect these fires from Sentinel-2 imagery um, using GIS and, and some deep learning approaches. So the two approaches you have to detecting fires are uh, first, analyzing the Sentinel-2 shortwave infrared bands. So bands 11 and 12 show shortwave infrared emission. And if you do just a, a, like a burn ratio, band 12 minus 11 divided by band 12 plus band 11, those fires, they'll just pop out. And not only that, you'll see recently burned areas too. It just pops right out of the map. You can take that a step further and apply deep learning techniques uh, to do object detection. And so I focused really on bands 12, 11, and two and set up and trained a deep learning model to go through and automatically detect the locations of these fires. So the idea would be say, collect some fires, train a YOLO or single shot detector model on those fires, and then use that model to detect more fires. So, you know, in terms of analyzing the shortwave infrared bands, um, it's really straightforward, right? So this is a picture of Sentinel-2 over a rural area on July 7th. And, um, you know, you're looking at this through uh, the shortwave infrared bands uh, and then band two, which is going to be uh, like a blue band and say, you know, you can see those fires pop right out at you, right? You see the active fires in, in red, orange, when, you know, the color that you would expect a fire to be. But then you see amidst some of them, a lot of brown and that brown indicates recently burned area. And so if you do that, that band 12 minus band 11 divided by band 12 plus 11, those fires and the recently burned areas pop right out at you. And so, you know, you can use this to uh, detect things that are currently burning, but I could also probably go back and, and start using this to quantify, you know, acreage of farm fields or forests that have burned. So, you know, fascinating, such an easy technique as, as doing this, this band math can get you really, really far. 
I wanted to take it a step farther. And in fact, my initial thought wasn't even to do the band math, but it was just to, you know, throw a deep learning model at, at the imagery and see what happens. Um, and so I started and, and, you know, where I'm still at is using YOLO V3 to, uh, a training YOLO V3 object detection model to detect these fires. And so, uh, the training data that I've generated is I'm, I've basically have a mosaic, a mosaic of imagery that I can go through with a time slider and select individual images going all the way back to February, 2022, um, when the conflict in Ukraine started, um, I've set the band combination to be the band combination that we've been looking at bands 12, 11, and two. Um, and I've gone through and manually put bounding boxes around the fires. Um, I generally don't do that kind of thing, but I was really curious and I, I just set aside the time to do it. Uh, I didn't train that many fires uh, on that many fires. You know, my first attempt, I just wanted to make sure uh, I, I was sane and that this could work. And so I collected 59 fires, trained a model and came back with a, a, a model that's record, reporting an 84% accuracy. And I then went back and trained even more, trained on even more fires and the accuracy went down. But to be perfectly honest, I'm probably not doing, uh, being the most diligent when, when training or collecting my training data. Um, but uh, I usually have an ArcGIS Pro project up where you can see these and I can pan through, um, which I'd be happy to show you after the fact. But it does a really good job at detecting these fires. So after I, I've trained this model, I go back and, and look at um, Sentinel-2 data, Sentinel-2 imagery in a similar time frame and have been able to use that model to detect more fires. Um, and I... I um, my map doesn't end up looking quite the same as the one in the original tweet, um, but it does pick up, pick up uh, a lot of fires that you might not even be able to detect because you can train these models such that, you know, if one pixel pops out bright red, uh, your, your model can actually pick that up. So I can pick up these more um, uh, smaller fires that are, that are in the imagery. And so, you know, the feat isn't just training a model to do this, uh, I've set up a system where I can basically generate this on demand for any day that I want to do it. And uh, I'm fortunate, you know, working at Esri, I have access to an ArcGIS enterprise that's hosted in AWS. Um, I have ArcGIS Pro in that and these, these uh, decent sized AWS instances to do my um, image processing for me. And so, you know, I can just do the generate these raster products that are my band combinations of uh you know showing that shortwave infrared um imagery i can automatically generate that that raster math uh image that shows you where the fires are and i can also execute those deep learning models um then taking that a step farther i can put those out into the world um through really nice web maps and applications uh, one or two of which I'll show you here. But I've effectively automated this process in the cloud um, using Python plus this ArcGIS um, enterprise environment. And I'm not, I'm not scheduling this. I'm, I'm kind of just doing this on demand because it satisfies my curiosity and, and uh, kind of socializes this, this problem. Um, but I basically have this infrastructure set up so that I update the Sentinel-2 archive daily. Um, I then process that Sentinel-2 data to generate the raster products that I'm interested in. And I submit all of this through, uh, through a, a, a Jupyter notebook that I have set up so I can visually see the processes and the jobs being executed and then the web maps being created uh, as part of those processes. So those web maps get, auto or those, those images that I generate get automatically added to web maps and then those web maps get auto, uh, get get added to some nice applications that I'll show you. And so for example, um, the first thing I tried was just processing all of July. And, you know, here's a sample of four web maps for, of Sentinel-2 imagery from, from July 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th. And you'll notice, right, they're not covering the same pit area every day because the revisit rate of Sentinel-2 is roughly once every 10 days. But every 10 days, I, I'll have essentially a, a map of the Ukraine uh, viewed through Sentinel-2. Might not be cloud-free, but, but I'll have that. 
one of the beauties of using this shortwave infrared band uh, to do this analysis is that you'll actually see some of these fires through diffuse clouds, uh, which I'll show you shortly. Uh, one of the apps that I've put together um, is, is a, essentially a, an, imagery time, uh, a, an imagery time slider app where um, I can change the dates of the imagery, but also do a swipe comparison of two dates uh, that I select. A second app that I've put together um, is more what I'm calling a, a sit rep or, you know, uh, yeah, a, a, a daily sit rep. This I'm using a, what, you know, a portfolio app where I can go through and I can show the shortwave infrared view, the natural color view, um, highlight the areas on a base map that have been on fire um, and, and do that in, in various ways. And so I'll wrap up my presentation by showing you what two of those apps look like. And so one of the fascinating things about this is that the Sentinel-2 data is updated in AWS daily. So I can actually get insight into what happened um, in Ukraine yesterday, or uh, in this case, on Tuesday. So what you're looking at here is a swipe app where I can select any two days that I want uh, behind the scenes here and do a comparison between those two days. So what you're looking at is March 4th over back in Ukraine. And you can see, maybe I should zoom in slightly, um, you know, these, these orange areas pop out as fires that were active at the time that Sentinel-2 flew over. And so if I swipe this to the right, you'll see March 14th. And you can see that that battlefront has changed, right? Fires, there were, you know, fires on the right side of the river there, but now, now the activity has kind of moved to the south um, of Bakhmut and across the river. And so I have, I have several days here. So let's say we want to go all the way back to, you know, February of 20, uh, February 22nd. There's much less activity and that activity is confined to um, the eastern side of the river. And getting to, you know, the value of, you know, the, your shortwave infrared uh, data, right? You can see those fires through, through the clouds um, in this case. And then the, the second app I wanted to show is this portfolio app where um, I've also run that um, uh, fire detection model on it. And you can see those fires from, I, I wanna say this one was February 22nd again. Um, you know, you see them in the infrared band, but you also get that, that object detection here. You know, if I go and, and change over to the natural color view, you don't pick any of that up, right? Um, but then let's say you are curious as to what buildings might have been impacted. You know, just throw this against the base map and, you know, you're within about, what, 30 meters of figuring out what building um, uh, might have been targeted. So, so um, to conclude, you know, I've, I've used Sentinel-2 imagery uh, to create this, this processing pipeline to alert me as to where fires are in Ukraine, and then um, uh, make some kind of assessment as to you know, how, how the situation is changing on the ground. And so if there are any questions, I would open it up to the audience. Thank you. Did you begin to mention, um, is there a way to clean up the cloud, um, the cloud data, like during different days if the atmospheric conditions aren't conducive, is there a way to help filter or clear out some of that um, obfuscation? Um, you can't, so like for a, a given day, I can't just erase the cloud and look under it, but I, there are techniques we can use to create, say, an, an average image of what uh, Bakhmut should look like on mid-March, you know, mid right? So, you know, there's techniques to do median, median pixel values over time frames of previous days to, to do that, but I can't just look under the clouds. Yeah. It seems like uh, with your shortwave infrared bands, those fires jump out. Why do you decide to train a single shot model when maybe, or how does single shot model improve against just thresholding for those bands? Good question. Uh, I'm not sure it does. And I guess what's funny is, I was naive and thought 
that I should just do the single shot model first, thinking that would be smarter. Um, and then a coworker who does, who does forestry basically told me, Hey, you know how, you know how people in forestry actually do this. They do band ratios of the infrared band. So I was naive thinking, um, that the single shot detector would be better when it probably might, it might be overkill in this situation. If, if I just have a case where I can, or an algorithm that just, you know, identifies the fires based on that band math and throws some kind of circle or something around them or, or grows the pixels out in some way, it might be more effective. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming. And, and thank you again, Greg, for that, uh, for that talk. Um, so my name is David Huberto. I am from uh, Riverside Research Institute. I'm a research scientist there, and I'll be moderating this panel on uh, the metaverse, maps to, to uh, metaverse. And on our panel, uh, we have um, Ethan Schaefer from uh, WashU in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. And then we have uh, Greg Bruner, who we just heard from, uh, from Esri. And then we also have uh, Timothy uh, Seams, um, from uh, reinventing geospatial Inc. So uh, thank you all for attending. And by way of kind of um, introducing uh, this topic, I just have a few slides um, that I put together that uh, uh, illustrate what I think of when I uh, think of the metaverse. Um, okay, so again, maps to metaverse. Again, I'm David Huberto from Riverside Research. Here's my contact information. And just a, a quick introduction to where I'm from, uh, Riverside Research at a glance. Uh, we are a um, not-for-profit research institute focused on uh, defense intelligence community. We spun out of Columbia University back in the 60s, um, and we have uh, about 700 um, employees, many of them uh, former uh, military or intelligence um, members. 93% uh, of uh, Riverside's employees have uh, some kind of clearance um, and and other, uh, you know, above that. Um, and we have facilities in Boston, Northern Virginia area, uh, Dayton, Ohio, um, New York, and other places. Um, so just a, uh, a quick introduction to where I am from. And within Riverside Research, I'm part of a uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning lab. And um, we are tasked within the organization to bring in early stage research and development uh, work um, in support of the other business units and to directly support uh, our government customers through early stage R&D uh, work in contracts. And so as a national security nonprofit, um, our group is looking to put the best of teamed human and machine intelligence uh, on tap for the warfighter analyst anytime and anywhere. Um, and we do this by bringing in technologies in machine recognition, brain-like computation, uh, and extended and uh, virtual reality um, and human machine synergy. Um, again, just to elaborate on that a bit, we have kind of three main focus areas with our group. Uh, one is object activity recognition. So in this group, we do things like um, classify, for example, uh, radio frequency emissions to try to detect anomalies. This is a um, work that we've done uh, through an IARPA contract. Um, we have a group working on accelerated uh, AI and ML using edge or neuromorphic hardware. So for instance, we can, uh, we're setting up a system to do, for example, benchmarking uh, across um, different methods to uh, have edge computing. And we have a group doing human machine teaming um, where we use uh, techniques from virtual reality, uh, human physiology and behavior monitoring to try to make uh, the interactions between human users and autonomous technology uh, more effective or to evaluate the impact that it has. But now on to the metaverse. So um, w w what is the metaverse? And I, you know, in many ways, I, I see this panel as uh, our opportunity to kind of have some people who've been thinking in this space uh, have a conversation and, and you all can watch and participate. And so I shamelessly pulled this image uh, from Meta's website and you know they they proudly show this, and to me, what I see um, there's a couple of really interesting things. You know, in, in principle, all these people could be working from home or working in different offices, and the metaverse can bring them together into um, a place virtually. Uh, however, um, this is a type of 
schizomorphism, or in other words, there is a element of this that is just recreating the world as it is. And there can be advantages to that um, uh, function in terms of function or design. Um, and there's examples all over uh, of technologies that do this. Um, things like having a, re a recording software that kind of looks like a microphone um, and looks like the analog devices that kind of go with it. Uh, lights that look like candles, um, even in our computers, the recycling bin. And uh, it's not necessarily clear that um, the best use of the metaverse, uh, for especially for geospatial intelligence, is to just recreate the world as it exists today. So what I would like to, um, if I had to kind of say this in a nutshell, uh, suggest is that we really want to think of new ways that we can visualize, analyze, or disseminate data that doesn't necessarily just recreate the way that we do it now, uh, although there could be advantages to doing things like that. Um, and, you know, just notionally, uh, this might look like being able to visualize yourself um, from a different perspective than what you might typically have. So I just grabbed these uh, straight off of Google Maps. Um, let's say that you are trying to figure out what is in an image um, on the left here, which is the St. Louis Arch. Um, it would be nice, uh, again, notionally, if you could perhaps put yourself um, in uh, in a different perspective. So you're not looking overhead. And Google has done this with with Street View. Um, but, uh, but, you know, this is maybe just scratching the surface. And in thinking about how we might get to a point where we can do things like that, uh, look at data in totally novel ways, um, and uh, avoid maybe just recreating how we do things right now, um, I'd like to suggest that there's maybe some key technology areas that will be uh, necessary or useful in this transformation. So I'd like to go through some of my thoughts, at least, on what those are um, and what they might look like. Uh, and in brief, uh, I think that it could include, at least, um, novel modalities for interaction for interacting with technologies, um, immersive or augmented interfaces, uh, real-time and reactive awareness of the user, uh, digital twins and novel data visualizations, and uh, generative AI uh, in order to um, build up or synthesize uh, models uh, quickly. So first, novel interaction modalities. Um, we're probably aware of the types of controllers that currently exist for, for example, VR uh, setups. And um, those are good. Perhaps they're better than a mouse uh, on your computer. But there's probably other things that might make a fully immersive experience um, more seamless and have a higher dimensional kind of input for you to, uh, to interact with. So there's controllers. This could look like things like cyber gloves that measure your hands or perhaps other limbs. Um, in the center, uh, you'll see I'm also wearing an EMG uh, setup. So uh, this is part of a project for a prosthetics um, uh, project. But, uh, but notionally, this could be used for an, inter an interface um, or whole body tracking. So you know the sky's the limit, potentially. And I think having novel interaction modalities could be important. Um, oh, boy. Well, I'll just go through this quickly. Uh, augmented and virtual interfaces, we're familiar with this. There's virtual reality that's getting better every year. There's augmented reality that's getting better every year. We all know about that. Uh, so real-time and reactive awareness of a user. I think this could potentially be very important. Um, and I think there's many potential avenues. But uh, just to, you know, um, get us thinking on the same page, this could look like uh, tracking behavior. So if a system uh, is going to be reactive to a user, it might need to know what they're doing, uh, gain, if you will, situational awareness about what the user is doing, uh, what they want, what their goals are, um, their pain points. Uh, and, and that can be achieved um, even currently uh, or, or possibly in the future with, with various technologies that measure things like physiology and your behavior. Um, so here I have eye tracking and pupillometry. Uh, we have notionally in the center an EEG cap that can be worn simultaneously with a VR headset. And then there's a proliferation of wearables that give you all kinds of great metrics like heart rate, um, temperature, many other things, uh, movement, activity. Um, I think things like digital twins and novel ways to visualize data could be very helpful. So again, just notionally, uh, the idea of a digital twin 
can we render real things uh, to high fidelity or the fidelity that you need for your analysis or, you know, program? Uh, and then also, are there just different ways that we can visualize data? So for example, um, maybe you're planning a route on a map. Uh, it could be nice to know what um, the environment's going to look like at different points around that route. And uh, with the proliferation of data, um, that, that could become possible. Uh, and then lastly, generative AI. So again, if um, we want to uh, have kind of novel experiences, novel ways to um, view the world, view data, uh, to take different perspectives, it could be important to have methods that can very quickly kind of spin up models. Um, so it might take, for instance, uh, a studio of designers um, weeks or, or longer to, to come up with models. But if you want to be able to prototype things or test things out, uh, maybe hypothesis test, it could be helpful to have um, artificial intelligence that can generate uh, models or assets for models uh, quickly and just kind of uh, increase the pace uh, of, uh, of that development iteration. Um, and, and I think that, you know, the metaverse can potentially interact with geospatial intelligence um, across uh, the sort of life cycle from planning, collection, uh, processing, exploitation and analysis and dissemination. And um, with that, I don't want to take all of our time. I know the panelists have great things to say, so we can uh, we can move on to that. Um, and so how this is going to work, we'll just go uh, first, uh, sort of a sweep through everyone, uh, hear their spiel, and then we'll open it up. Um, I have some questions. Uh, I'll try to be reactive both to the panelists and to the audience. Uh, we'll give you all a chance to ask questions um, and otherwise interrogate us. So uh, let's see what we learn. Uh, so first... Let's hear from um, Timothy Seams. How's that? Uh, Kathleen said I could walk around, didn't you, Kathleen? And I do. I do a lot better if I walk around. So, um, so yeah. My name's Timothy Seams. I'm from a company called uh, Reinventing Geospatial. But um, and I'll get to the metaverse. I promise. Uh, but I have a question. Uh, who remembers Counselor Troy from Star Trek The Next Generation? Yes, Diana Troy, Counselor Troy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What was, what was her uh, special power? What was her special ability? Come on, Star Trek people. Does anybody know? She, could, she had empathy. Empathy. So she could she could feel what you're feeling. If you were trying to lie, she could detect that, right? She could she could tell uh, if you were afraid, right? So she would stand next to Captain Picard and and give him him advice like, oh, that guy's lying to you, or you know that creature has malintent or something like that, right? So uh, that that was her special ability. That was her special power. And uh, today, the U.S. military understands that it can, uh, when it's in a force-on-force -force kind of conflict, it understands what to do. They have peers and near peers, and they understand a strategy on how to overcome that, right? It's, I need a bigger sword, I need a faster jet, I need this or that. But what they lack is insight. Right, they sort of lack the ability to understand the will of what's behind their opponent and why that opponent is acting the way that they're acting or what their motivations are. So, uh, so they're really good at force on force, but they they want this insight. And so, if you start to think of warfare. In a, in a manner that is more like will versus will. I am trying to impose my will over your will, okay? And not a force on force. You can see how understanding the having insights into, into people's motivations and their intent and why they're doing things is important. So 
this is called cognitive warfare. And it's something that the Army's quite interested in. And, and a, a quick example, and I'm not trying to be political here, is that in Afghanistan, the US and the Russians before us completely outgunned everybody in the country. We had more guns, we had bigger tanks, we had air power. But in the end, the, the will, what we thought Afghanistan, Afghanistan excuse me, should be is not the way it's turned out, right? So that's, that's kind of a quick example of that. So, so how, do we, how do we get there? How do we understand the will of a people or a group or a region? Or how do we understand what the motivations are behind those things? So in order to get there, and you guys are doing good, stay with me here. We're gonna do a mental exercise, all right? Um, so I want you, so one of the most powerful things that, that we as humans have is our imagination, okay? Everyone has one. Uh, so just think about it, you can imagine anything, all right? So if I say to you, okay, uh, imagine a giant flying, octopus that comes from outer space and covers St. Louis. Okay? Everybody's, that's in your mind's eye right now. I have placed something there. It took you zero effort. You've imagined it. Now is, now is what I'm imagining exactly like what you're imagining? Probably not exactly, but it's probably pretty close because you have a personal context. You understand what St. Louis is. You understand what an octopus is, and you have this imagination that here comes this octopus from outer space. All right? Now, if I wanted to take that mind's eye image and explain it to someone that didn't have my personal context, how would I do that? If I was trying to, if I was talking to someone that had never heard of St. Louis, never been to St. Louis, and didn't know what an octopus was, okay, how would I get them to understand what I'm talking about? What do you guys think? What would I do? You put in words, you draw it, describe it, maybe I take, make a picture, maybe I create a video, use special effects. This is what happened, right? Exactly. We use creativity and art to express these ideas of things to other people that don't have our same context. Okay? And that's the power of imagination and creativity and art. All right? So I can even take this to intangible feelings. Right? I could put scary music behind my video and say, we were all frightened when the giant octopus came, right? But then I switch it to fun music. All he wanted was Ted Drews, so we're all good, right? So you can even project feelings on that. So where, where am I going with this? You guys are like, where are you going, Timothy? So <clears throat> my point is, as human beings, we have a, a, this incredible creative capacity uh, that can bring art and creativity to a problem. And what if we used that to go back and applied that to cognitive warfare, right? Where we're trying to figure out the insights of our opponent in a, in a different sort of manner, right? So that's, so roundabout, here I am, that's, exactly what the army has asked us to do <laughs> in a in a what's called a cyber or small uh invent in thank you patty small business innovation research project so it's called art plus all right and the idea behind it is how can we use art to help us make better insights and decisions in these really difficult situations, impossible to solve problems, right? How, how, do we, how do we divine the will of the people that, you know, we're trying to impose our will over so that we can 
get to better solutions quicker. Um, so that's, that's sort of the gist of what this project is all about. And we're in the very beginning phases. We're still in phase one. We're still just trying to define the problem, really. Um, but it's incredibly interesting. And, and there's just, um, what, they, what they really want is that counselor Troy, right? They want that system next to them that says, hey, this is, this is what those people are thinking. This is how they're feeling. And they want to be able to run, you know, what if scenarios. Well, what if we, what if we did this instead? What would be the outcome? So it's very predictive. Or, you know, you can, how do you sway the will or change the will in, in those sort of manners? So how are we going to do this? I have no idea. Uh, it's very tough, but I do think there's some things that are going to help. And, and this is where the metaverse comes in, right? So we've got the metaverse where theoretically it's going to be a place where we can go in and we can create things using our imagination uh, that are otherwise impossible or impractical to build, right? Spatially, we can, we can visualize things or we can use art. Our art, our imaginations can become art. Uh, and maybe, you know, sooner or later, uh, we'll even be able to use AI inside of these things. That's another big piece of that, where um, we can enhance uh, our ability. Because if you've used chat GPT yet, you know it can take just gigantic amounts of data and and just bundle it down for you into a few sentences that's easy to understand. Well, think of being able to do that with giant amounts of video or artwork or opinion pieces from across the globe or, you know, all sorts of things. There's just, uh, AI can change how we distill information so that we can understand it quickly. And that'll certainly be a, an important piece so, and then finally, the data, you know, and you mentioned the data in your opening. I, I'd like to say I, I even want, I mean, all data is good, but I even want biased data. And you're like, look, biased data. Why does this guy want biased data? This doesn't make sense. Well, it does when you think about it in the context of the will. If I want to create a meal for Patty, uh, what do I need to know? That's something that I... I want her to like. What do I need to know? What's her? What's she like? What's her? What's her preferences? Right? I might even need. I need to know. Well, is she allergic to anything? Or maybe she has some religious beliefs that prohibit certain things. Right? So now, if the question then becomes, well, if my if I want to deter Iran from getting nuclear weapons, what do I need to know? What are they going to do with those weapons? Why do they think they need them? You know, and what's the, what's the beliefs behind who they are that are driving these decisions? Okay. So those are the, I want that biased data. And then maybe in, in a system I can even, okay, turn up the conservative piece. Nope, turn, turn that one down. Turn up the liberal piece. Right, and I can understand what different approaches or different leadership might act like. Um, so that's part of it uh, as well. So all that to say, uh, that's what this project is, and we just started it. So hope to come back in six months and let you know how it's going. Uh, and that's how it ties into the metaverse. And so thanks for listening. So I'm I'm kind of torn on the metaverse. You know, on on one hand, I don't use that much of it, right? I I have an Instagram account. I don't use it much. But on the other hand, there's a ton of really interesting information out there that I actually search for, right? You know, I'll get my news from Twitter. Esri posts a cool map every day on Esrygram. I'll look at that. There's a wealth of data out there. In fact, you know, I, I gave the Ukraine presentation and part of the idea I had going into that was that, you know, I can, I can look at 
an area of the world every day, create a map of it, automate shipping the map, then why don't I throw these images up on Instagram, put that into the metaverse? And I think that's kind of where my interest is. Like, why aren't we taking more real time or not necessarily near real time information and putting it out there in places like the metaverse or Instagram as soon as we can and letting people harvest it there, right? Why do I need an Esri web map or a cesium map or something and a whole web page for something when I could put chips of events I see in the Ukraine in Instagram? Um, maybe the St. Louis Police Department could put like crime, crime camera snapshots on Instagram, basically leverage this, you know, build up the metaverse platform with meaningful data so then people uh, like myself and some of my coworkers could then exploit it. And so on one hand, I, I don't put stuff there myself. On the other hand, I could extract a ton of information from it. And it is the place where everyone goes, right? Like these, these sites like Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, it's where everybody goes for their information. So why not feed into that? And even though it's not my platform and I'm not necessarily going to make money off of it, um, um, build up their AI so that if somebody's looking for a certain, a map of an event, Instagram has that archive of those maps of events. Um, so I'm, I'm generally not sure where the metaverse takes us or even how, how to use it. Um, I don't think I'm that visionary of a person to like figure out how to, how to, how to leverage metaverse for my own personal financial goals, right? Like I haven't figured that out with Twitter, with Instagram, not going to happen with metaverse, right? Um, but there is some kind of value out there. And I think, um, I think my interest is in, you know, how do we harvest that value? Um, I mean, the last thing I, I'll say is, you know, like TikTok, I heard a rumor that like the Chinese actually are using TikTok to map the interiors of buildings in America and other countries, right? Because there's all these videos of the interiors of, of places. And so China now has TikTok where they can harvest and maybe make 3D maps uh, or 3D interior maps of these buildings. And I thought, I don't know if that's true. It's probably possible. Um, we should probably do that. Uh, and I think that's more my interest. Like, how do we do that kind of thing? Um, and, you know, how do we, how do, we do it first? So yeah, those are just my thoughts, nothing too deep, but uh, just what's going through my mind. <laughs> All right, yeah, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. And, uh, and so we, we just heard from Greg and then uh, Timothy before him, and then yeah, next, uh, Ethan Schaefer. All right, hello, everyone. You can hear me all right. Uh, so uh, mine's gonna be quite different, I think, than what we've we've heard a little bit so far. Um, uh, mostly how we're using AR for education uh, at Washington University in St. Louis, right, right locally here. Um, I'm the technical lead for the Fawcett Laboratory for Virtual Planetary Expir Exploration uh, in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences, as was uh, as uh, as I was introduced. And you might ask, why do you care? Why why are you why am I here? Why are you listening to me? Well, the biggest reason is that Fossil Lab is the AR hub for the uh, Danforth campus, the main academic campus for uh, WashU. If you were here a month ago or were tuning in, uh, we got to hear about the medical campus AR, and this is our this is kind of compliment on the on the Danforth campus. Um, we support AR in two ecosystems, uh, the uh, Geo Explorer app, and uh, also uh, in person at our lab in the Rudolph Hall 192. And so we'll be talking about what we're doing and what I think is the future of AR, and then therefore the, the metaverse in education, at least from my vantage point uh, at WashU. Uh, very briefly, I wanted to mention how we got to where we are. Uh, we were uh, founded through a uh, donation, I believe posthumous actually, by uh, the estate of Stephen, Steve Fawcett. Uh, he was a well-known businessman and explorer. He had about 100 world records when he died, including uh, first to circumnavigate the globe in a balloon and first to circumnavigate any plane without refueling. Uh, our full name, as I said in the first title slide, is the Fawcett Laboratory for Virtual Planetary Exploration. So where does that bit come from, the virtual planetary? Well, that's actually how we got our start. Uh, the reason we are in existence is because we have a cadre of uh, planetary scientists, especially Ray Arvidson, who at the time was the chief uh, surface scientist for the uh, Curiosity rover shown there, uh, landed on Mars in, Mar in uh, 2012 and is still running. Uh, 
we geologists, uh, although we, we, it might be great to think in, in, in ways that are unlike our interactions with the real world, we actually prefer to interact with uh, the real world as much as possible. And so we wanted to recreate the experience of being out in the field geologically, putting yourself on the planet Mars uh, and, and prospecting, doing field work, um, you know, looking at outcrops, walking around and planning the traverses for the Curiosity rover. And so that part of that was done in-house at WashU uh, because this lab existed. And that's what was the, was, the, uh, was the original intent of the lab. Since then, it's grown uh, far beyond that intent. Uh, until 2014, we we're actually using a cave, the uh, cave automatic uh, uh, virtual environment. Uh, but since 2016, we've been transitioning to AR and, excuse me, well, AR via hull lenses and mobile. And then actually just in the last couple of years, since I arrived in mid-2021, we've diversified uh, splitting LiDAR drones, uh, photogrammetry, and uh, non-AR software development. So we, I wear a lot of hats. So this is the GeoExplorer app, and uh, it is available on iOS and Android. There's an asterisk there to remind me of a snafu. Uh, it is down just at the moment on iOS. It'll be back up in a few days. But uh, it is available um, on Android uh, now. Uh, this ballooned in use at WashU during the pandemic. We had lots of professors far afield from outside of uh, uh, what, is, what is basically a geology department, far afield, uh, humanities, et cetera, saying we can't engage with our students in the way that we're accustomed to. And we think that this technology would give us a way to actually at least make something a little bit more alive in their living room. Um, and so that was a big project um, before I came on, um, but we thankfully still have that, that, that investment in the form of Geo Explorer. Definitely encourage you to look at it. It's a, it's a, it's a fun app. Um, note the variety. You may not be able to read the small print there, but this is just the menu uh, from within the app. Uh, first four are all geologic in origin, but we have biology, uh, see anthropology, architecture, art history, drama. Again, even though we started with geology and we're in the geology department, we have become the hub for AR across the Danforth campus, which is, I think, a pretty exciting role to play. Especially because I think WashU is, is pretty far ahead of, of a lot of other campuses when it comes to AR uh, integration into education, which is great. So here's here's how we're using the hull lenses. Believe it or not, I, I know we're all a lot of tech savvy folks in this this um, audience, but we're actually still exclusively using the hull lens ones. Partly our software was developed for that. Uh, we're actually looking at migrating hull lens twos now, but they also serve our purposes for the time being. So I mean that's that's kind of the reality in education is that we use what we have um, and we make creative use of it rather than necessarily always always upgrading or looking at the next thing per se. Uh, we developed a few apps for the HoloLenses. You can see those kind of uh, uh, represented here, the Geo Explorer and Crystal Viewer. Sandbox is the least exciting app, but again, getting back to the point I just made, education makes use of what we have. What's great about the Sandbox is it's basically a slab of buttons and just a shared ecosystem where we can, uh, users can, professors, students, myself can all be in the same room, see the same objects, uh, rotate, translate, uh, rescale and and share that experience. And so the shared experience is really our value add, and it's the the, the most economical way to just throw a model into um, into an ecosystem. So we actually end up using the sandbox for for most of our needs. Uh, give you some use cases the way we actually use AR in the real world and day to day uh, in our lab. Uh, Mars rover traverses historically, um, but more recently active planetary research. Again, geologists like to get their boots dirty, and if they can't do that literally, they'd rather do it at least virtually. Uh, geologic education, obviously, but what might be a little bit surprising to you uh, is that our main service provided now is for terms of, of hours is actually humanities education. It has ballooned, and so even though we are in the geology department, most of our uh, clients are professors in, in the humanities and outside geology. And so I wanted to give you a few examples that I think kind of illustrate some of the diversity that I've seen used within our lab. Uh, Professor Christina Klukin, uh, Chinese Art History, she is perhaps one of the most creative users, I think, of, of our technology. And, and one of the things that she pointed out to me, I, I will confess, I came into my job um, with no background in AR. I was tech savvy and a planetary geologist. That's what they wanted. So I, I've, I've learned on the job. But um, I, will, I came into it thinking, okay, so AR is great to recreate the real world, but, but how, does it, how does it really add? And, and she finds great ways to add. One, is, one example is that this is a Shengdeng. It's a bronze vessel from 6th century BCE in China. What's great is that she has seen this in person at a museum, but she was not, and she's, she's brought students with her too as well, but she was not able to have the same conversations with those students that she can in my lab. And the reason for that is because she can touch the artifact, she can turn it upside down, she can look at the underside of it. She can also uh, peer into it, which is actually, it's too tall in real life to be able to peer into it. So there's all sorts of things she does, but it's just one example. Um, on the other side, you can maybe barely see, it. it's very hard to see with the yellow circle. There's actually a seam. 
And she said, I have never, ever, been, even when I brought students to this artifact in real life, I've never been able to talk about the fabrication techniques of this vessel because you can't lift the vessel in the museum. You can't get a student underneath it, but I can do that in augmented reality. So I get to lift it up and see the seam. And then we can follow the seam where it goes underneath the handles and understand how the artist used those handles, not just for function, but also to hide the seams that were up along the side. So she actually got to use it as a springboard to talk about fabrication techniques, which you could never have done even if she had the money to, to, to bring all the students to this museum. So I think AR really is impressive in the way that, it, that she's using it. Another example, drama, recreations of Greek dramas from a little bit of a different vantage point. This emphasizes the, um, uh, uh, the, the grief-stricken uh, loss of, of a daughter by the uh, uh, main female character in a classic Greek tragedy, whose story really hasn't been the emphasis of, of kind of retelling. So it's kind of retelling from, from her perspective, which I thought was really impressive by uh, Professor Elizabeth Hunter. And then Professor um, Eva Euclid had the most, I think almost out of the box thinking because she came to me and said, okay, I'm, a, I'm an Italian foreign language teacher. How can AR help me? And, you know, I initially thought, well, maybe, maybe you want to explore somewhere in Italy. And, and we got talking for a while. And she said, you know, I really just want my students to exercise their language. I want them to have a, uh, a set piece, a, an exciting environment to discuss. And she said, you know, we have a games unit. We talk about the suits of cards. Why don't we put them in an Old West saloon? So that's what we did. We put them in an Old West saloon. She had the students go around, look at the poker hands. They realized there were five aces. And they got to tell a story about, oh, maybe somebody was cheating. Maybe there was a shootout. It's a very inventive way. This was the only time I've ever had a professor say, I don't want to put the object of study per se in the environment. I just want to create a set piece for conversation, which I thought was a very interesting way to do that too. So I think there's been some uh, practical challenges and opportunities that AR education faces that I definitely have some counterparts in the commercial realm and, and in the government, um, the uh, more public realm, but also um, some some distinctions that I think are worth thinking about. So funding obviously is a, is, is a problem for all of us, but in the academic world, I, I like to think of this as a little bit in the sense of whether technology is established. So if you take a really long view, if you look at a thousand year time scale, books are a technology. You know, before that we had scrolls and tablets. Books didn't exist, you know, 800 years ago. Oh, excuse me, uh, like 2,000 years ago. Well, let's go to that. Um, so, uh, excuse me for that. Um, but, but books eventually became established. Now, of course, it's expected that a university provides books for students, provides access you know, there's, there's investment there. Uh, computers, likewise. There was a time when computer um, uh, literacy was not expected of students. And now universities accept that they have to provide computers and access and, and, and teaching and, and software, you know, ArcGIS, for example. So, so this has slowly incrementally increased as technology, but it's always, you know, behind, of course, what's cutting edge. I think, I think AR is wrestling with that now. It, it has been very hard to get the funding that we need, even at the department or university level. So we had been very creative. But I will say that I see signs of that changing. Uh, when, we, when we were established six years ago uh, in 2016, well, the AR part of us was established six years ago, six, seven years ago now in 2016, there's no way that humanities would have had enough money, uh, been able to get enough money to actually start a lab like ours, and which is why they're using us, because there is no humanities equivalent. But that's changed. Like I said, I see signs of that changing. Just late last year, just a few months ago, uh, WashU not only... Uh, greenlit um, internal funding, significant internal funding investment in a humanities consortium project specific to AR. They are also, they also went out of their way to say, you are the single project in that funding round that we are most excited about. And we expect you to be able to, uh, hint, hint, go out there and get millions of dollars in external funding. So at least at the WashU level, at the, at the university level, there's now expectations that AR can actually deliver in a way there wasn't even just a few years ago in education, which I think is really exciting. Uh, there's also the issue of competing and converging interests. So the reason that I have the job I do, even though I didn't have an AR background, is because we couldn't, uh, we, I say we, Fawcett Lab, couldn't afford to pay for a full-time uh, employee, believe it or not. I'm the only employee. So they had to find somebody else who was willing to partner with them. And so that, I'm not kidding, the advertisement was, we want a planetary geologist, studies Mars, Moon, Mercury, that sort of thing but is also really tech savvy, interested in AR, and willing to do mostly technology stuff and not geologic research, which is a very weird advertisement. Um, thankfully, I happen to be one of the very, very narrow uh, band of people that was interested, but this is, this is something that I think eventually we'll have to get away from so that it's not ad hoc and, and, and trying to, to, to squeeze into the little nooks and crannies, but rather, again, an established technology where convergence of interests across the university are recognized. And I think that, that that funding for the drama, excuse me, for the AR consortium, humanities AR consortium is, is a good sign that things are changing. Uh, I also wanted to point out real quickly, I think this is important to everyone when we talk about education, is that equity and diversity, inclusivity issues, 
uh, I think AR has a real potential in the metaverse more broadly to, to really deliver on these. And I think it's something that, uh, at least in my, my, my experience, has been sometimes overlooked. I think it's something we really do need to think about. Uh, economic is one example. So there's, there's pros and cons to all of these. Economic, unfortunately, AR is still, AR is still relatively expensive. Um, a lot of the humanities professors I know are, are actually at the level where they have considered paying for out-of-pocket just to use us. Uh, the university hasn't given us the support, so professors actually have to provide funding for the, our, 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 our use in our facility. So that's, that's crazy terrible. On the other hand, it's also true that once AR becomes more established and more democratized, you could offer rural students the opportunity to visit a cosmopolitan museum, which is much, much cheaper than obviously you know, flying everyone there. And so I think there's economic potential, but we need to see the, the investment to bring the technology um, uh, more, more accessible on an economic level. Uh, physically, uh, we actually have had students who were not able to access field uh, sites, uh, geologic field sites of great importance. Uh, and uh, they just simply couldn't get there. They might be onto a wheelchair, have other physical uh, limitations. But now we can actually bring the field site to them. We can bring that virtual experience to them. We've done that. These are actual examples of real students who have benefited from the fact that they can now experience genuine geologic uh, outcrops that would simply be inaccessible physically to them. So I think that's a great coup. That's a great win. For There's another thing that we were just talking earlier about, um, about different ways to interact, to see us move in ways that are also accessible. I have, I have a twin sister who could not do the two-hand interactions that we rely on in our lab. And I want to see... I want to make sure everybody is included. Nobody gets left behind in the metaverse in our race to uh, make make more uh, technology, more move technology further. Let's also move humanity further at the same time. And then one last example that's actually come up in real world in 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 our lab uh, is voice recognition. We use voice recognition for some of our our operations, but those engines have been trained on male voices. So we have female professors who are have a very difficult time interacting and they've complained to me and we're actually working on that right now to include buttons all the verbal uh interactions so that they don't have to rely on it but that's you know that's yet another equity issue that we have to be aware of that pollutes metaverse just like it pollutes all the other technologies so that's all i had for today thanks great thank you ethan so these were um yeah, very interesting. Thank you all for for these perspectives. Uh, we just heard a lot, and um, I, I, I want to uh, offer a few things. So I, I can uh, offer the, the panelists if they're so motivated to um, react to one another, uh, it, and then I, I, I can uh, get things started off as well um, with a question. And uh, and I would like also to give the audience a chance to um, interact, have questions. Uh, you could pose a question to. Um, the panel at large or to a particular individual. Um, so, so let's, let's go through all of those things and then we'll just keep going until we get cut off. Uh, but it, at first, um, we, we heard a lot, a lot of perspectives. W one thing that I noticed as a bit of a recurring theme is this idea that we take um, data from the real world and then somehow uh, use that to reconstruct a representation uh, virtually. Um, and uh, perhaps this is partly captured by the concept of a digital twin. Um, but, but one question I'd, I'd like to pose, um, uh, it, you know, if, if you have something to say about it, is um, are there potential pitfalls to, uh, to this approach um, that we should be aware of? And, and is there anything that we can do to um, overcome those or guard against them? Uh, and so that's just one thing to get things started, but um, we can kind of open it up. There we go. So, um, potential put, uh, pitfalls, and I think uh, uh, Ethan just mentioned some of this stuff. The, the and I I like the word that he used. Um, how uh, biases can pollute, you know, our technology, right? When and uh, a lot of that is unintentional, but. Uh, if you think of data, very, very little data is just pure data, right? Uh, even even a lot of our scientific data is slanted somewhere or another uh, because of our biases, right? And the things that we're taught to believe and that maybe aren't quite right, right? Or untrue or just have a, have a um, poor assumptions, right? So that's obviously anything, anytime you're making these decisions off of, big sets of data, um, you have to 
take that in mind. And as human beings, we're trained to believe what we see and hear in real life, right? And as you enter into the metaverse or as you enter into, you know, uh, a world where an AI can make a fake video in 10 minutes, right? That looks perfect. Um, we have to, we have to untrain ourselves to believe everything that we see and hear and start to use our reasoning powers and our, our questioning and, and, uh, other filters that, uh, uh, so that we're not deceived in, in a way that we don't want to be. So obviously I think that's one of the big pitfalls. I mean, I, I worry that once, um, information gets to the metaverse, maybe it's too late, right? Um, uh, if you're looking at the metaverse as a way to drive some kind of immediate action, um, if you're remote and participating in the metaverse, but something happens too far away, what is your role? You know, are you just a, a passive observer? Um, does that make you complicit if you see something and can't do anything about it? Are we just overall creating a, uh, a universe that on some level is just for our entertainment and that we're somewhat detached from? So, I mean, that's a, a big picture, you know, concern around, you know, what is, what is the metaverse? My, my first thought about uh, hazards with digital twins are that, uh, at least in my experience, and there's lots of other reasons too, but one of the reasons that I've experienced digital twins is, is either uh, representation or, or preservation. So digital archaeology might take, uh, um, it might build a 3D model of um, a, a, you know, an ancient um, site, archaeological site in Iraq, because they're afraid that, that it might be destroyed at some point in the future because of political unrest, for example, or, or, or ISIS back uh, non, not that far ago. Uh, but what do we preserve? How do we choose what's worth preserving? I think that's a really big question. And, and digital twins aren't just about uh, uh, preserving what we think is valuable now, but what might be valued in, in the future. And that's a very tricky thing to do. I think that we can only really do that more fairly if we have more people in that decision-making chain, uh, in the funding chain, about what, uh, what projects um, are considered valuable enough to, to preserve and to represent and to disseminate uh, if we're only focusing on, for example, recreating uh, uh, sculptures from um, European classic uh, history and not from uh, African history or Asian history, I think we're doing a great disservice not now, but also not just now, but also perpetuating that bias into the future because those items might be lost by the time by the time there is greater appreciation of their value. So I, I think that's that's something we really need to act now for the sake of the future. Great. Um, so I, I'd, I'd like to offer the, the audience, if you have any questions to, uh, uh, you know, raise your hand, we can bring you a mic. Um, and, uh, otherwise, um, thinking about, you know, we were just kind of talking about, um, made me think about something I, you know, that I was, uh, wondering about in preparation for this, um, which is, you know, if we're moving into, uh, a world where there's all this data, uh, and we have things like digital twins and new ways of interacting and, and the world kind of moves, moves past where we are, we, we might end up leaving a lot of things behind. Um, and in thinking about sort of back compatibility of, uh, of data sources, um, and, uh, and, and just making sure that we kind of are capturing. And I think, you know, Ethan, like you were saying, sort of cataloging, um, and, and not leaving, uh, you know, not having gatekeepers, um, kind of in, in the role of, uh, you know, deciding what, what goes in. Um, so I think that's interesting. And then I, I see a couple of questions um, from the audience. So I think uh, we're going to have a microphone passed around here and we'd be happy to take those. So I'm wondering how uh, privacy uh, fits into this, because in order to create a digital twin, you know, we talk about, uh, you had in one of your presentations earlier about um, picking up and sensing people's feelings, their emotions, their reactions. Isn't that part of be, of creating a digital twin? And if we, if our society is around privacy, I'm not saying it's good, bad, or ugly. I'm just saying 
how do you capture that information in order to create a digital twin specifically around uh, people um, and organizations? Just curious on your thoughts there. It, it reminds me, Anne, of um, we uh, several years ago, Chris Ashbrenner and I, you know Chris well, um, went out to Hollywood and I was working with NGA and uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, but we would go, we went to different visual art studios. And um, at the time, this was probably about 10 years ago. Uh, I learned at that point that any video that I saw from now on, I would question because they would show things that I would, I was just like, that is amazing. How did they get that person to say that? And I, it was fake, right? It was those deep fakes. It was the beginnings of all that. Um, but uh, it reminded me that in a movies, and I think they still do this, um, they'll take, you know, a they'll make a digital twin of of the of the main character actor, you know, with Tom Cruise or whatever, and they'll ensure that. So in case he dies or is defaced or whatever happens to him during the making of that movie, they can put a another person in there and project his image onto that person and finish, you know, their entertainment piece. So uh, I don't, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that type of privacy, right, or those rights that we have as individuals to who we are as people, uh, if we were going to make a digital twin of yourself, you don't, I mean, it's identity theft if that gets out there and someone makes a, a video of you or whatever, right? So um, having insurance and having, you know, special rules and laws around who you are is not just a, uh, on paper, but, you know, your, your physical being, I think is definitely in the future to protect privacy, among other things. Yeah, I, I don't know how privacy is going to be handled because it seems like it's a little bit too late with the technology that he's talking about, right? I mean, even I think Google released their generative AI in the past few weeks and some of the the deep fakes are impressive. And, and I've, I've seen some tutorials where they're like, you know, 100 lines of Python code, you can be doing this yourself. So... Um, I don't, I don't know how, how, uh, how we're going to ensure people maintain uh, their own online identity because it seems to me that's going to be, that's going to be uh, hard, to, hard to enforce. I think this is where like the divide between, you know, metaverse and reality actually comes in, right? Where, you know, I, I mean, unless I'm like Mark Twain and, and there's another, an impersonator walking around or, you know, somebody, uh, you know, has a f physical impersonator, you know, there's only one me. But in the metaverse, um, I can imagine there being several presidents, several, you know, Tom Cruise's, several famous people. And um, I don't know if there's anything you can do about it at this point. So um, perhaps you need a lawyer on the panel to explain kind of legal implications of what happens, what happens when you start doing that, right? Like, uh, um, so, so yeah, no, that's, that's just my thought. Okay. And I'm not, not sure that I have a whole lot to add, but I, I do agree that there, there is this distinction, which really hadn't occurred to me until we were having this conversation, that uh, hey, the insuring an actor's face, I, I always thought of that as being a physical replication. Uh, but realistically, we're, if you're going to replicate an actor, you also have to replicate their personality on some level. Right? The things that make them even more distinct that might matter to them more. I mean, having an identical twin uh, gives you a physical duplication. Uh, you know, you may have to learn to accept that, but... Uh, your personality should still be. I still know identical twins. We're very, very different people. But if they can actually recreate you, that's that's more than an identical twin. That is a pervasive twin. And I, I I don't know how we deal with that and how we separate that. But it's also true that if you can only recreate physically, then what's the value? If you have a Tom Cruise that's stilted, uh, that's that's not what you you want to ensure. That's not of value. And so on some level, I don't know how you distinguish what might be uh, saleable um, and conscionable from what might be uh, questionable. I don't know how you do that. 
I mean, we volunteered all this information and put it out there ourselves already. So what kind of privacy do we want? And if you're Tom Cruise, isn't more Tom Cruise better, right? He can just monetize that. Um, and and can it, if his profile could be any higher, raise his profile. Um, I'm not necessarily making the argument, but I think it's an interesting, interesting thing to think about, right? Like um, we've given up certain rights to, to privacy by just posting things ourselves. Um, uh, what happens when somebody else steals that, that virtual identity? Um, what if they profit off of it and you don't profit off, profit off of it? It's a very, a very interesting question. I think there's just so many layers to it that, that you could just explore. Great. Thank you. And then I, I think we had another question. Um, yes. So I have one. Um, I'm going to ask, you know, obviously products and services or even concepts like the metaverse uh, matter with the reception of the intended audience, just like a lot of products and services. But do you imagine the vision of what the metaverse is, is similar to the movement of the iPhone when it first came out? Obviously, if the intended audience is at a mass scale, things like security matter a lot more, personal security and things like that. But if it's niche towards specific use cases in certain communities, that really limits uh, uh, how much of the issues some of these expand into, right? So I'm curious to see what you think about where this is heading from a vision standpoint on the scale of what you think the metaverse applies to from a, from a product, service, or a concept to mass adoption. Any opening thoughts? Um, I think uh, the the technology that makes the metaverse cool is going to get better and better and better, right? And um, your the uh, your experience inside of a virtual world. Uh, will only become more enhanced over time. So, um, so that, you know, at some point, uh, I don't, it'll, it'll be reality just as much as, you know, your, your waking moments probably to, to some extent. So <clears throat> that, I mean, that's a long term view and I don't know, I mean, the, the, the problem with the, the virtual reality is it's not real, right? And, but because it's not real, that's why you can create products and services inside of it that uh, you wouldn't normally do anywhere else. Um, I mean, you think of the medical applications, you know, you go to the doctor in the virtual space and you say, I gotta, I gotta, my side hurts, you know, well, okay, well, let's open that up and look at it, right? I mean, there's just, I mean, there's so many bizarre ways to create uh, imagined value in, in those places. So I don't, I have no idea what's going to stick and what's not going to stick. I, I mean, remember that the days before we all had iPhones <laughs> and cell phones, um, and there was a big deal. Oh, someone's going to make a phone and it's going to have a camera integrated in it. Wow. You know, that sounds pretty cool. Well, I mean, I don't think anybody foresaw that now I can't leave the house without my iPhone because half my brain is stuck inside of it. Right. You know, <laughs> probably couldn't even make it to my car <laughs> without it. So anyway, uh, what the metaverse, you know, it's like the internet, uh, you know, the the any of these big uh, advances in technologies. Um, if people find some sort of value in it, they'll we'll figure out how to make money off of it, and that's where you know the the product products will explode. That's what I think. Yeah, I think that's where it is. You know, how do you how do you uh, get the value out of it? And I guess in my mind, the value is how does it make your life more? How does it make your life easier? How does it uh, make things more convenient for you. Um, the iPhone's already done a lot of that, right? Um, apps on your iPhone, 
get your your Grubhub, order your your food and pick it up, that kind of thing. Um, from this this digital twin perspective, one of the discussions I've had with coworkers is that you know Esri has a product called Indoors, which facilitates indoor mapping, and we were sitting around talking about you know how does how does a stadium use an indoor map and you know some of some of the people are saying well you know we can generate routes to get to get to you know get our popcorn and our beer or whatever but i think what it really should be used i don't, I don't want to be walking around a stadium with my head down looking at a phone especially when it's you know it's an oval or a square shape or something it's not hard to navigate but what i what i would like is to not have to get up from my seat during a cardinals game and have those food delivered like right to my seat and I think that's where this concept of the metaverse can come in where, you know, these small, these small areas where um, if you can get, get a good location of somebody, uh, put your order in, um, you know, you're paying $10 for a beer at a Cardinals game, they might as well deliver it to you, right? So, uh, you know, get your stuff delivered to you and, and um, make your life more convenient. Um, granted, I'm still a physical person in that physical setting, but but we've mapped out all of these other 3D virtual spaces, uh, uh, 3D spaces in a, in a virtual way so as to understand the nooks and the crannies and things down to, you know, a, a seat level. Um, so yeah, to me, the value is, you know, what can the metaverse do for me in terms of making my life easier and, and making products and services, you know, more convenient for me? I think this is not a problem we're ever going to get away from as technology changes beyond the metaverse and AR, really any technology. Um, but I do think that there's always going to be that tension between privacy and and convenience. Um, I remember telling a friend of mine, I'm not sure my opinion has changed much, I have to think about this, but about 10 years ago uh, at a uh, wedding, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who works at Google at the time. And uh, yeah, I told him I would happily give Google 100 times more information if they made my life 1% easier, which was my opinion at the time. Um, but I do think that there, there is a value in, in personal individual empowerment, right? So if you look at the Europe, you know, cookies have been around for a long time, but now Europe has taken this regulatory approach that now is cascaded across everywhere so that everyone now gets to choose whether cookies are accepted on some level on every website. And I think that that's catching up a little bit. So I think that's the same sort of thing we'll see with AR. It's too new. We won't see a lot of regulation up front, but eventually just like drones, just like cookies, just like literally everything we, uh, digital harassment, everything you can think of that is an abuse of technology, eventually we're going to see, see laws put in place because uh, I, I, or regulation, at least, at least in some places, and I don't see a way around that. So I don't think AR is any special. You stand by the statement that you would give Google a hundred times more access. <laughs> That's a good question. Is that <laughs> yeah, yeah, I may have. You know, at, at the time, I guess I was thinking uh, more information about like internet history, and I, and I actually still think I would. But but when it comes to something more personal, we just talk about personality. Like, would I give them my personality to make my life one percent or ten percent easier? I, I don't think I'd do that. So it's it's a good question. It's a good question. Great. Um, did did we have additional questions? Yeah, I want to make sure the audience can. Uh, ask if we got a lot so um okay got it okay um just a just a small comment and then kind of another question back to the art issue that timothy um raised so the comment that we didn't talk too much about advanced manufacturing you know creating processes and practicing those and um augmented or virtual reality to get to effective um uh, manufacturing processes. And then, Ethan, you talked about learning. So those are things that personally I'm excited about in the use of these technologies. But one thing that does worry me is the creation of art and and how that's going to go forward, both with AI and um, the metaverse. And so, you know, I, I was listening to, I'll talk about Tom Cruise, and I was thinking at the same time, this hadn't really occurred to me, until you said this, Timothy, the recreation of Tom Cruise in with his face and whatever else. Um, well, what do you eventually need Tom Cruise for if you can create a Tom Cruise? So, and and similarly with um, art, you know, uh, the New York Times just covered something where a movie was created um, from, uh, you know, a sci-fi movie that was looked very compelling and beautiful, and it had no human. Um, 
uh, interaction. It was just completely AI generated. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know if you guys have any further comments about the artistic, um, I, guess, I guess, challenges that we're going to face um, given these technologies. <laughs> um, so g going back to what are what what are we uniquely as humans, right? Is one thing is the imagination, and um, I I understand that um, that fear. You know, I get, I don't know if it's fear, but you know th that concern. I guess of well, maybe we won't need artists anymore. I don't think so, though. Um, uh, I think, like any good medium, you know, AI is will be a tool in the hand of an artist, uh, and um, certainly, you know, it might replace things, right? But um, horses are really great; uh, they're 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 wonderful. But I think we're all glad that they were replaced by cars, you know, and so it it's just the the progression of of the race is going to be in such a manner that um these things will come and things change and that's okay i think I, but uh one thing that if you if you look through history what has endured art the word of an art you know things that have been written down and things that have been created by artists that that's that's the history of our planet really uh, and the human race piece of it so i think it's going to continue to be that way I don't, I don't see that changing yeah no that's a great point uh i, I think at the end of the day things are going to be personal preference right like do people actually like the art uh or are they buying it because it's a novelty that's been generated uh, by ai um i don't know um i think you, if you look at the evolution of movies right? Over the past two decades, there's been a lot of CGI incorporated into movies. I find myself less interested in, in your, don't kick me out for this, in like your Marvel and your DC comic stuff, just because I know there's so much CGI and it's, it's so, uh, so distanced from reality. Um, but at the same time, that's just a personal preference, right? Those things are going to dictate, um, what people like, what people consume. Um, I do hope that the real art persists uh, like it has for the past, uh, for the past millennia. But, um, yeah, those are just my thoughts. I'm happy you brought up movies because that's actually where I went exact, uh, immediately. My, uh, my wife is an animatic editor. So she actually makes videos of storyboards. Um, and you know, her, her aspirations are to work at something like Disney or Pixar and she'll be using computer generated, uh, animation. I mean, very, very little is done hand drawn anymore. Um, but she also has an enormous respect for the hand-drawn animation that was done before. So I think that, unfortunately, you know, technology marches on, and I think that does change some of art. On the other hand, I don't know that she would actually, her job would really exist in the way it is without technology. And so I think that technology continues to create more opportunities for artists as it also creates less opportunities in other areas. And it's just, it, it's not going to change. I don't see anything, any way in which that changes. But I think that we can always, we'll always appreciate art, as, as you were saying, personal preference. Uh, uh, one of my wife's all-time favorite movies is one of the last major motion pictures that was done completely hand-drawn. And it's because she recognizes that incredible art. It's not because she's, she's devalued it. And I think to a significant degree, a lot of what AI art has done is, is, is regurgitates kind of what exists. And so there's still, there are still frontiers to be pushed with art, artists that I, I don't think that at least AI as we know it today uh, is going to completely push those frontiers. So I think there's always going to be uh, trailblazing artists. On the other hand, though, I mean, you don't like CGI, but you know, Jurassic Park was originally going to be claymation, right? So yeah, you, ha yeah. you have to decide, you know, at what point is technology more of a benefit? It's, it's a tricky question. We were talking before about, you know, how do humans work with the, the AI, with the, with the tools? I think that's kind of what it comes down to, right? Um, it has definitely benefited animation. I mean, some of the animated films are, are phenomenal. Um, but I'm curious to see what happens when people start putting out something, com you know, completely AI driven. Is it, is it going to be, is it going to receive a positive feedback from audiences, from, from consumers? 
are they going to choose that over Jurassic Park? I mean, I could probably go home and watch Jurassic Park today and still enjoy it, uh, even though there is there is uh, there's aspects to it that are, are completely CGI and and um, you know it's all just fantasy. So. <laughs> Right. So I, I know there were some questions over here. Um, or th they still exist. I saw some hands. Um, kind of along those lines, kind of juxtaposed to the uh, privacy question. Um, what role do you think do the developer community and open source is going to play in the metaverse? And especially if you're looking for more adoption, if you're looking to really increase the access, um, you know, what currently exists in those spaces and then what role do you think it plays? I'd, I'd like to see more tools that uh, allow um, allow someone who is maybe a novice artist to try to make their own animations, to, to try to enable novices, people who are not experts, to at least learn on their own uh, how some of these things that... Uh, a Disney or Pixar or Google or Amazon does it themselves. Um, I hope that these kind of things become empowering to people to um, enable them to do things that they thought it took an expert or, you know, uh, uh, 15, 20 year experienced person to do. Um, just my, my thought on that is, uh, I, I mean, I'm a huge proponent of, of open technology and um, what your question brought to my mind was was open AI and uh, their work with chat GPT and even uh, it's been released the version four or whatever I think it is right now uh, and it's all open stuff so as these really really game-changing powerful tools get out into the world um, it, I think it is important to, to keep them open and if we can, right? Um, these things, uh, the, the models and things that at where we're at right now today just consumes a huge amounts of energy, right? And, uh, and there's a lot of work behind them. But the more we can share, uh, I think the safer the, the whole world will be. Great. Great. Oh. One uh, question. So are you familiar with the TV series Upload? Where they die and they upload their body. So the they upload their body uh, into a virtual environment. So how far yes. away are we from that? How far are we? So, are so that we can, we can save our relatives so that we can <laughs> continue to experience them. How far are we from Upload? Um, <laughs> Yeah, so if you're not familiar, it's a TV series where um, when people die, they uh, scan their brain right before they're dead or something like that, and then they get uploaded into a virtual uh, reality place and their personalities live on. Um, that's a great metaphysical question. <laughs> and... Uh, being so, I'll, I'll go there since I got the question asked. I mean, um, <laughs> the I'm a I'm a uh, spiritual materialist, if you will. So I uh, I do believe that the you know the the our our reality has been set, but I also believe that it's been set by a creator, right? So and that there's more there, but he's basically set it all together with 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 uh, physical things. So. I believe it is in the human capacity to figure out almost all of those physical things. Um, where where the boundary is is that metaphysical boundary and into the the spiritual things. And so, uh, if that if that helps, that's that's where I think those things are. I could we get to a place where we could have some sort of personality that's completely, you know. Um, still it's still physical right it's still in some sort of database or it's still in some sort of electronic form that's similar to us uh i think maybe because we're that way right now and we're physical beings right so um that's 
it's an interesting question and, and it's, it gets dumped right into what is AI, right? And at what point is their consciousness in an AI and, and that sort of thing. So um, great question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I wonder, you know, let's say that does happen. What's the difference between content generated by that entity and a deep fake, right? Because that entity no longer is, is um, a simulation of something that used to exist. So is that just a deep fake that we're using for whatever purposes we have? Because I, I swear I've seen like people have sent significant others like birthday greetings from their deceased relative or deceased father, um, right? They've, somebody's generated this um, um, AI and, and the, the person speaks as though it's, you know, been filmed. So I, I don't know. I, I think uh, I'm going through in my mind like, okay, okay, there are these steps to get there. But what's really the difference between that and, you know, fake Tom Cruise right now? Uh, it's fascinating though. Um, and Somebody's going to, somebody will figure out <laughs> how to do that. Um, but yeah, that's just my thought. So my, 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 can, I have actually, I've only seen a trailer for the, the show, so I'm not very familiar with it. But I would say the path to that end is concerning. Even if we could imagine a world in which eventually you could recreate the person reasonably enough. What about when you're halfway there, when you're 80% there, when you're 99% there? What if you weaponize that, right? But if you can take somebody's personality and their beliefs and tweak it just a little bit and so you can show them evolving into beliefs that you never had or, or you know, positions that you never held. Uh, I think that that's even, in a, in a way, even perhaps worse than a deep fake because they, that, that hypothetically, that, that entity could explain how they got to that position. And so now you're no longer in control of even your own destiny and your own future. It's, it's now been co-opted. Um, in a way that, that I think is, is, is deeper and more perverse than, than simply deep faking, um, a, you know, a, a, you know, a, a speech that a pol politician never gave. I think showing that politician evolution to a view they would never have hold, held is, is perhaps per even being more dangerous. And I think that that would have to be on the road. I don't know how you get from, from where we are now to hypothetically being able to upload yourself without going through that dot. I don't understand how you would. And that's what scares me most. Yeah, fascinating. So I think we have time for one more question, and that'll be you. Going back to the topic of cognitive warfare, um, do you think something like chat GBT, GPT will take statements or like things that leaders said and potentially help with what their thoughts could possibly be? That, that is an excellent question. And if you, if you have not used chat GPT yet, you... I urge you to go and play with it. Um, it is fascinating. You can throw any any text in there and ask it questions, uh, and it and um, it'll it'll surprise you. So yes, I believe that's going to happen. It might be happening already. Um, as far as you know, it, and it gets to that part of what. the army is wants from us to do on that project is is if the will of the people is this and i change this little parameter does that shift the will of the people and can i ask the computer right well what's the will of the people what was the will of the people before um lincoln was shot you know and, uh and then and well, what if this had happened or that had happened? How would that have changed? So uh, from a political standpoint and leadership, the the whole idea is to be in the majority of the will of the people, right? So you wanna you wanna fine tune your your message so that it hits all the right people, right? There were the most people. So yes, that's definitely sorry. <laughs> that is definitely something that uh, is is in the future for that kind of technology. Yeah, I, I agree. I I want to try to make a, a simpler analogy of this. Uh, you know, people already make all these analogies like or, or, or say, well, you know, if John F. Kennedy were alive, what would he think? Or if um, or oh, what would Reagan do? 
you know, so we already have these discussions um, and put these hypotheticals out there. The, the, the AI, the, the thing that we say uploaded into uh, the metaverse is just going to be another voice or another, another tool to persuade or dissuade. So just another piece of information we're going to have to try to sort through.